back everyone. Our next uh, talk will further highlight cardiovascular hypertension work being done in rural Georgia. I'd like to introduce Dr. Kinran A. Abisogan, who earned his medical degree from Rutgers Robert Wood Johnson Medical School in Piscataway, New Jersey. He did his internship and residency at Warren Alpert Medical School of Brown University in Rhode Island Hospital in Providence, Rhode Island. He then went on to do a fellowship in interventional cardiology and cardiovascular disease at the University of North Carolina Chapel Hill. Dr. Abisogan is a board certified or is board certified in internal medicine, cardiovascular disease, interventional cardiology, adult comprehensive echocardiography, and a re registered physician in vascular interpretation. That is many, many things. <laughs> He is a member of the Society of Cardiovascular Angiography and Interventions and the American College of Cardiology. Dr. Abisogan has special interests in high-risk coronary interventions, peripheral vascular disease, and care delivery to underserved populations. Welcome. We look forward to your talk. Well, thank you for having me. Thank you for having me. It's such an honor to be able to present here. So I want to get right into this. Thank you for those kind words, and I will attempt to share my screen. Give me a moment. Okay, we can run your slides for you. You just need to ask for the next slide if we can't keep up. You got it. You got it. That's perfect. All right. Am I unmuted? Yes, you are. Yes. Okay, excellent. Excellent. So thank you for those kind words. Uh, my name is Akinara Bisagun. As uh, you heard I'm a cardiologist here in uh, Savannah, Georgia, interventional cardiologist, and um, uh, I work at uh, St. Joseph's Candler Health System and South Coast Health. We can go to the next slide. So I have some uh, ambitious objectives today. I want to go through the um, pathophysiology of preeclampsia, um, hypertension states of pregnancy. We want to define what those hypertension states are the management of preeclampsia. Then we want to define some other cardiac conditions in pregnancy, including um, um, peripartum cardiomyopathy, its pathophysiology, and its treatments. Next slide. So this is just kind of a graphic to show that all these conditions are sort of um, interconnected. Next. So chronic hypertension is a pre-existing hypertension which, continue, which uh, uh, continues during pregnancy. Gestational hypertension occurs after the 20th week of gestation without end organ damage. And preeclampsia is hypertension after the 20th week of gestation with end organ damage. And that can include proteinuria, impaired liver, liver function, thrombocytopenia, uh, and pulmonary edema. Next slide. So preeclampsia can affect, uh, is very um, um, common and affects up to 8% of the population here in the United States. So this slide is to uh, sort of highlight the uh, importance of preeclampsia. If you can go back to that uh, chart. So Preeclampsia and in, in patients that have preeclampsia, that they are at an elevated risk of major adverse cardiac events, even after delivery and even if they recover from preeclampsia. So even with preeclampsia alone, you're at an elevated risk as you age into your 30s, 40s, and 50s of myocardial infarction, stroke, and other cardiovascular issues. And we see that when you add on um, small for gest gestational age, preterm delivery, with preeclampsia, uh, and that's the purple line um, here at the bottom, those patients actually have the worst outcomes when it comes to major adverse cardiac events, even if they've recovered from preeclampsia after delivery. 
So as we've um, mentioned, preeclampsia is one of the leading causes of maternal and fetal morbidity and mortality. Um, risks for preeclampsia include uh, premeparity, multi-fetal gestation, obesity or elevated BMI, and pre-gestational diabetes. Uh, in order to really um, understand preeclampsia and um, its pathophysiology, it's, it's important to understand what is normal um, during pregnancy in the cardiovascular system. Uh, and this sort of highlights uh, that as uh, we progress through uh, pregnancy, the cardiac output increases, the stroke volume increases, and the heart rate increases. And the cardiac output actually increases by up, up to 50% um, during pregnancy. So the placenta is very important um, in pregnancy and actually causes a, a decrease in systemic vascular resistance. And what that means is during pregnancy, um, this allows for an increase in the cardiac output without an increase in the blood pressure because systemically there's more vasodilation and that should be placenta mediated in no normal pregnancy. Now, in preeclampsia, there is a defective placental angiogenesis and endothelial dysfunction that occurs. And you're going to hear this SFLT1 throughout this talk. And it's getting into the weeds, but this is basically an anti-angiogenic um, substance that causes a decrease in an angiogenic substance called VEGF and placental growth factor. This chart sort of uh, goes through the, the progression and pathophysiology of preeclampsia. So when you have those risk factors, there can be an impaired trophoblast invasion and spiral artery remodeling, which can cause um, decrease in the placental perfusion, which causes placental hypoxia and, and um, uh, stress, which increases the angiotensin II sensitivity. And this can cause an increase in some of these factors that we discussed, like SFLT1, which causes a decrease in angiogenesis, an increase in endothelial dysfunction, and an increase in um, systemic, uh, excuse me, sympathetic nervous system outflow, which increases the heart rate, increases the stroke volume, and unfortunately can decrease angiogenesis and lead to things like pulmonary edema cardiomyopathy, which we'll talk about, and uncontrolled hypertension. Long-term, it's important to remember, just because these are young women who are in their 20s and 30s who are at an overall low risk for um, myocardial infarction, stroke, coronary disease, even when uh, uh, these young women recover from preeclampsia and um, um, gestational hypertension, they are at a two-fold increased risk of cardiovascular disease later in life, and that can include hypertension, stroke, coronary disease, myocardial infarction. So it's very important that we get a handle of this disease early on. Management is important. Early identif identification and monitoring is important. Delivery is always the best treatment if the fetus is at term. Early in pregnancy, it's important to control hypertension as best we can and assess the maternal fetal conditions with a high-risk OBGYN or maternal fetal medicine specialist. Some complications of preeclampsia to keep in mind include HELP syndrome, and it's in the name. It's hemolysis, elevated liver enzymes, low platelets. This can be a fatal condition, and immediate delivery is indicated here. There's increased risk for pulmonary edema, renal failure, liver hemorrhage, uh, DIC or disseminated intravascular uh, coagulation, placental abruption, acute respiratory distress syndrome, sepsis, stroke, and fetal maternal death. So again, HELP syndrome equals delivery, ASAP. The management uh, includes antihypertensives um, and for chronic antihypertensives, excuse me, for chronic hypertension, the treatment goal remains less than 140 over 90. So early identification is important. Um, 
in, in, in pregnant women who um, are developing high blood pressure, we must look for uh, edema, pitting edema. We have to look for neurological symptoms, including clonus or exaggerated deep tendon reflexes. And uh, laboratory testing is also important, including uh, urine uh, protein screening. And I'm kind of I'm, I'm I'm hammering this home because it's very important. This is a placenta mediated disease process. So once you know health syndrome, fetal distress is 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 identified, immediate delivery is really the only treatment. So there's many things that can be done that don't include delivery. Obviously, we've we've hammered that home, but aspirin and calcium therapy can be uh, beneficial and preeclampsia. There is some research that statins, metformin, and some exercise is, is helpful. There has not been um, uh, clear benefit identified in strict bed rest, fish oil, folic acid, garlic, sodium restriction, and different vitamins. Again, identification important is important. This is a cool chart for me because people always ask, what's one plus edema? What's four plus edema? Really, it's, it's a matter of how far you could depress your finger um, into the skin. Um, and when it is up to two millimeters, it's one plus, four millimeters, two plus, six millimeters or C, uh, three plus, and then eight millimeters would be um, um, four plus. Next slide. So I think it's pretty obvious here, this um, person's foot is, is pretty edematous and, and four plus pitting edema. If we see this in pregnancy, we really have to have a high index of suspicion for uh, hypertension and preeclampsia and treat accordingly. Clonus, I'm a cardiologist, so I'm not gonna get into clonus, so we'll skip that slide. So the management um, includes um, maternal and fetal assessment, activity restriction, restriction of salt in the diet, With the chronic hypertension, we have to really assess for um, fetal effects like growth restriction, which can lead to preterm birth, and uh, really look for increased um, mortality with the fetus. So we just have to really pay attention to that one. Different medic medications that we can use include uh, labetalol, oral nifedipine, IV hydralazine. Um, in severe hypertension with preeclampsia, it is important to admit the patient to the hospital. That should be done. There should be a low threshold to do that. Loop diuretics for the edema that we, we showed you. And um, anticonvulsive therapy with magnesium will be important. And uh, again, these patients tend to uh, um, not get to term. So steroid injections, as indicated, with um, the OBGYN will be important. So some key points, hypertension during pregnancy is common. Urgent delivery and induction is recommended with other adverse conditions such as pulmonary edema, co co coagulopathy, or fetal distress. And in women who become pregnant, who have chronic hypertension, we still need to follow those goals to reduce the bl blood pressure in the 130s over 80s. And very important, just because we have gotten through preeclampsia doesn't mean we basically just forget about the woman who had the baby. They are at an increased risk of uh, major adverse cardiac uh, events later in life, and we need to really um, follow those ladies closely. So we're going to shift gears to peripartum cardiomyopathy. Um, this is a this this significantly increases the risk of severe um, maternal morbidity and mortality. It's an idiopathic um, cardiomyopathy presenting with heart failure, um, secondary to left ventricular dysfunction, presenting uh, toward the end of pregnancy or in the months following delivery, where no other cause for heart failure is found. Um, um, usually there's no prior history of heart disease, especially in very young people who tend to get this. And the diagnosis is confirmed by echocardiography with a left ventricular ejection fraction less than 45%. 
there is a geographic variation in the presentation of um, peripartum, uh, peripartum cardiomyopathy. In the United States, it tends to occur one to three months postpartum and often in the first few weeks after delivery. Um, uh, in other parts of the world, such as in South Africa or in Germany, in uh, Germany, uh, the presentation can be a little delayed three to six months. We do see that in the United States, but it is less common. Uh, the uh, proposed etiologies of peripartum cardiomyopathy, there is a lot of research and it is not well understood um, what causes this, but uh, one thing that is um, consistent with preeclampsia is there can be a release of that same um, protein SFLT1, which is anti-angiogenic, and that has been proposed, go to the next slide, as a potential cause of this. And as you can see, this, this one is very interesting. So if you look at um, women as they go through their pregnancy, postpartum, there is a significant increase in the SFLT1 levels. And as that level increases, the incidence of heart failure symptoms with uh, uh, those patients increases significantly. And that typically occurs, at least in the United States, in the first one to four weeks post-delivery. So it can happen during pregnancy, but it is actually very, very important, and perhaps more important to really focus on the postpartum period in these women. So this is an investigation of pregnancy-associated um, cardiomyopathy. It's a small study. It looked at 100 women with um, peripartum cardiomyopathy and checked their left ventricular ejection fraction at baseline 2, 6, and 12 months and looked at events such as death, transplant, or LVAD, or left ventricular assist device. Um, and less than 13% or 13% had an event um, or left ventricular ejection fraction of less than 35% by one year. Um, no subject with an ejection fraction less than 30% recovered. That's very important. So when women have very low ejection fractions, less than 30%, it is highly unlikely that there will be a recovery of their heart function in the postpartum period. And very important too, black women, when you compare to um, uh, white women or Caucasian women, have a lower likelihood of recovery to their baseline ejection fraction. So the initial evaluation is important. It's important um, to assess their, um, for cardiovascular or cardiopulmonary distress. And in patients with se severe peripartum cardiomyopathy with card cardiopulmonary distress, it's important for, to go through volume, uh, use diuretics as, as necessary. Um, you may need to give oxygen. Inotropes are, can be used in this setting. Um, we have um, put patients on uh, milrinone while they're pregnant to get them through the pregnancy. And then um, bromocryptine should also be considered. If um, needed, me mechanical uh, circulatory support can be indicated. But if it gets to that point, these women usually need to be transferred to a tertiary care center that can do that. Um, without um, cardiopulmonary distress, really the, the focus is hydralazine, nitrates, beta blockers, and diuretics, really the same therapies that we give from heart failure. But of course, we can't give medicines like Entresto, um, ARBs, ACE inhibitors during the antepartum period because those are um, teratogenic. So on this left column, we focus on hydralazine, nitrates, and beta blockers to really help um, maintain the ejection fraction as best we can, because as I've demonstrated, if the ejection fraction gets too low, we shift into a very chronic heart failure um, situation with a low likelihood of recovery and potential for transplantation or, or decreased life expectancy down the road. And this really says the same thing. 
really says the same thing. There's a higher risk of prolapse with um, subsequent um, pregnancies as well when the ejection fraction is lower. Um, increased morbidity and mortality are noted. So, um, pre and premature delivery and abortion is unfortunately common in these scenarios. Now, if there's a complete recovery, there's a better prognosis. Uh, there's about a 20% likelihood of relapse and the rate of recovery is higher. And later on, um, the pregnancy is more likely to be normal. So we have to counsel patients um, often who come into the office uh, and it's, it's the, always the question is, I've had a child already and I wanna have another child and what are my risks of developing a cardiomyopathy or death with the subsequent pregnancy? It really, really depends on the ejection fraction and, and an echocardiogram is at the core of this evaluation, but I also recommend, and it's not on this slide, but it's recommended to get a, a cardiac MRI as well with and without contrast. And what you look for in that situation, you wanna look for infiltrative disorders whether it be amyloidosis, sarcoidosis, something else that can actually reduce the likelihood of recovery in the ejection fraction. So in patients that fully recover, they are at a substantial risk of relapse too, regardless, but their risk of death is lower, less than 10%. Usually they have a, a decent um, outcome and they can they can go on with a, with a normal life. Now in those that have a poorly recovered LV function after peripartum cardiomyopathy, there is a high risk of relapse, but the risk of death is upwards of 10%. And there is a higher risk of premature um, delivery and a higher risk of death with these patients. So it's very important um, in, in these patients to have uh, very um, aggressive management, including um, bromocryptine postpartum, um, oral heart failure uh, medications, which cannot include the ARBs and ACE inhibitors, at least when the patient is pregnant, but hydralazine and nitrates, vasodilators and diuretics. But these, this counseling is important because there is a high, high risk of relapse regardless and a higher risk of death if um, the left ventricular ejection fraction has not recovered. So in Hinesville, you just heard a, a very uh, powerful story, um, and we, we have a really, really great team. Um, I practice out of Savannah, Georgia, but I spend a lot of time in Hinesville um, for part of the week in uh, Liberty Regional Hospital, and um, Sandra Wells, Heather Daniels, uh, Seth Borkway, um, Dr. Seth Borkway, OBGYN, Dr. Keisha Callens, OBGYN, and they, they've done a great job with the Mom's Heart Matters program. And in this program, we try to identify patients early on that have risk factors for preeclampsia, hypertension, peripartum cardiomyopathy, and get them um, uh, the need, get them the follow up they need. They have early follow up with cardiologists, usually me, um, before they deliver, and then frequent follow up after they deliver to make sure that we identify these patients early and and make sure their ejection fractions or blood pressure are as optimized as possible to make sure they have a good long-term outcome. So it's a, it's a great program. That's something that's being done now. We don't see this a lot throughout the country, and we do have an opportunity to really affect um, change on these women. So thank you for having me. Excellent. Thank you so much. That was a really great um, review for us and really highlights some of what's so important about why we are doing our cardiac bundle right now. Um, so I really love that you highlight the work that y'all are doing in Hinesville. Um, and I do want to um, open up to questions, but I'm, I'm one of the, the things that we know is um, a big step for hospitals that are trying to do what y'all are doing <laughs> in South Georgia is putting together the team um, to getting a, you know, 
the OBs and the MFMs and the cardiologists, and the anesthesiologists, and all the folks together. Um, and I'm just wondering, um, I see that Dr. Callens is on, um, and I'm not sure if we can, if I can put you on the spot, I would love to hear from both of you about how you put your team together, um, kind of the intentionality behind it and how it's working for y'all. AV team, can we unmute Dr. Callens? Well, I'm not unmuted. I'm muted. I'm not unmuted. So um, <laughs> you can I'll start. <laughs> so, so I've been I've been in this community for about you know, five years, and um, I've been practicing mostly in Savannah, and I come down to Hinesville at least once a month, and I was introduced to uh, Sandy Wells. Um, she uh, she uh, oversees the cardiac rehab program over at Liberty Regional Hospital, but she has a real passion for um, um, uh, pregnancy pregnancy related heart conditions. So she actually approached me to see to gauge my interest in really being sort of a champion from the cardiovascular standpoint, and to be willing to see these patients as needed and to bring them into my office early. And it sort of grew, that's from my standpoint, it grew from the OBGYN standpoint. Dr. Callens can talk more about that and the planning purpose. But Sandy, she was kind of a, a power horse, a, a workhorse and a, a real powerful advocate for her patients when it comes to really making sure cardiology has been involved. 